It being four o'clock, I will call to order the regular meeting of the West Basin Engineering and Operations Committee and a special meeting of the West Basin Board of Directors. And with that, Mr. General Manager, do you uh, see if we have a forum? Happy to do so, Mr. Chairman. Director Harold Williams. Here. Chairman Desi Alvarez. Here. Director Don Deere. Here. Director Gloria Gray. Director Gray. Here. She was here. Here. Thank you very much. Uh, Director Houston. Mr. Chairman, we have a forum. Okay, next is, do we have any public comment? Mr. Chairman, we have not received any requests for public comment, though this meeting is being held both virtually and in person. If there are any members of the public that are with us today that would like to make public comment, please let us know. And if there are any members of the public uh, joining us virtually that would like to make public comment, please indicate so now by raising your virtual hand. Seeing none, we will move on. We don't have any presentations today. That is correct. Okay, so the next uh, item up is the action calendar. The first uh, item on our action calendar is an amendment to the lease agreement with the City of Torrance for the La Joseco pump station. Mr. General Manager, would you like to introduce that item, please? Yes, Mr. Chairman, as you mentioned, item 5A uh, is related to our lease agreement with the City of Torrance. This is related to the PV lateral uh, recycled water project. And for this presentation, we have Veronica Govea, our engineering supervisor. Good afternoon. Thank you, EJ, um, Chairman Alvarez, directors. Uh, apologies have in advance, but um, this is an item that in the past we have presented uh, various DNO committees. And one of, one of the items that we have been discussing with the CEO Torrance, uh, Electronic Flight Control District has a easement uh, in the nearby area where we are putting our pump station. And one of the easements uh, that crosses uh, the, the the front of the pump station basically belongs to Electronic Flight Control District. And Electronic uh, has basically asked the city of Torrance to provide them with a covenant to make sure that the easement agreements that they had agreed to in the past will stay remain uh, in place. So the city of Torrance has reviewed this item. They have provided a proposal for modifying the existing agreement and uh, our legal department has reviewed the amendment and we are here to present basically this item as, um, as an item to allow the general manager to be able to sign once it's approved by the city of council uh, by the city of Torrance, which is happening tomorrow. Uh, last uh, month, they went to closed session and they were able to get to an agreement. So tomorrow, city council meetings happening, and they will be basically approving or will be making a motion to approve that board memo. So uh, with this, I will read the recommendation. Um, and recommendation reads as staff recommends that the board authorize the general manager to execute the first amendment to the Lago Seco Pump Station lease agreement and grant uh, of easement with the city of Torrance. With that, I'll take any questions. Okay, thank you. Do you have any questions? No, thank you. Director Deer, do you no. have any questions? Director Gray, do you have any questions? No, thank you. Okay, just for clarification, so this is something that the city council or the city board. They are planning on approving tomorrow. Okay, and so the only other pending approval of this is West Basin. And then uh, does the county have to take any action or? No, that language has already been basically reviewed uh, by the city of Torrance and the agreement for the easement with the electronic flood control district is between the city of Torrance and uh, electronic flood control district. The electronic flood control district provided their corresponding request. The city of Torrance reviewed that information and basically they did modify or provided a proposal for the amendment on that agreement. We did review it, we have few edits, and basically that was reviewed by our legal department who said that it's fine to, to approve. Okay, thank you. So hearing no other comments, we will move this forward. I concur. Okay. Uh, next item is, uh, <clears throat> 
A request to amend the project budget for the Bonita Melinda McDonald Carson Regional Water Recycling Project Phase 2 expansion. So, uh, Mr. General Manager. Yes, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. This item, item 5B, is a continuation of a discussion that the committee and staff had uh, just this past month. Uh, and again, for this presentation, we have Tom Benner, our engineer, too, for the presentation. Okay. Good afternoon, directors. So, as EJ mentioned, we're bringing back the action item regarding a budget increase for the JMM Carson Phase 2 project. The support of this action item begins on packet page 50. We'll be signing the presentation on page 55. Thanks, sir. So, first, I'll begin with a quick update on progress since last presentation. Uh, if you may remember, we were installing the HAC systems last month um, in last month's presentation. So they're now fully installed and we put the testing on them last month. Uh, that's another picture on the left here. Once all the paperwork for those is complete, we'll be handing them over to our contract operators and our operations team. The image on the right here, you can see some stenciling being done on the, across the front. So we're labeling up all of our process piping. Uh, this is one of the punch list items that we're finishing up now that we're in the commissioning phase of the project. Next slide. These two images show membranes being stored in one of the racks. We're currently setting up our clean and place and backwash sequences. We decided to only use one rack of membranes for these uh, the sequencing so that uh, to minimize the potential any damage to the membranes. So once we have those systems dialed in, we'll install the remaining membranes on the remaining five racks and prepare the system for the full 30 day continuous run that will complete the commissioning phase. So we're currently scheduled to begin this 30 day step in mid January, and so the remaining membranes will be installed over the next couple of weeks of preparation. The 30 day testing is one of, if not the most critical component of this project. This will be the final acceptance test for the system before we take ownership and end the project. So the contractor is tasked with running the system 24 seven for 30 days. They're allowed a cumulative downtime window of only 1.5 hours across the entire 30 days. So if at any point they exceed that 1.5 hours of cumulative downtime, they need to restart the testing. So obviously there's a risk there um, of project extension, should there be an issue. The budget increase today assumes that 30 day testing will be successful and won't require, won't require a restart. Uh, we're working very hard with the contract and the vendor to ensure that we're set up for that success. However, we're not going to accept a system that has any issues. So if faults occur, we may be back. Budget increase in the future, we need to restart this test in place, which is due to by mid January. Um, before I move on from the progress pictures, I also just wanted to mention that we had an incident at site last Wednesday. Uh, the exit gate got snagged on a chemical truck leaving the plant. Um, I understand you've been informed. Uh, I just wanted to give you an update. The gate has been damaged and will need to be replaced. Uh, we, oh, I'm afraid I don't have any pictures of it yet. It happened uh, too close to the location. Uh, we've got temporary fencing in place. Uh, when the damage occurred, we notified the sheriff and then placed additional security until the temporary system was installed. Um, we have vendors out there this week assessing the damage. We expect to receive a quote soon. And we're investigating potential reasons for the incident and uh, Aqua JPIA will be notified. We're in discussions with them. So I believe you'll further information later on. Uh, next slide, please. So here we have the usual progress update slide. To date, we are 171 calendar days beyond the calendar date and discussions are still ongoing with the contractor about how best to extend the contract to cover this period. The contract has earned 93% of the construction contract so far, with the remaining costs mostly attributable to the commissioning phase, but now in. We've processed 340 requests for information with one currently outstanding, and we processed 376 submittals out of a total of 382 submitted. Next slide, please. Uh, as I mentioned last month, we're on track to hit all of our PLA targets at the end of this project. So approved local workers made up 33.5% of all labour hours, while 6.5% of all labour is conducted by at-risk workers. And we have far exceeded our apprentice target uh, with 22.2% of all labour hours going to apprentices. As I mentioned last month, we have very few labour hours remaining on this project. These figures are unlikely to significantly change. Next slide, please. So we have here our table of total hours. As you can see, 10% of all labour hours are undertaken by works from Division 1. While two thirds of all the workers employed by our general contractor were either from our service area or LA County. 
Uh, this table shows the same hours divided into craft. Uh, I went through this last month. There's very little change from last month. Um, I'm happy to go through it again at the end. Uh, next slide, please. On to the action item. So the next four slides are identical to the ones we showed last month. So I can either go through those again if you'd like and detail the three major contracts on this project and expenditure so far, um, or we can move straight on to additional costs and funding. Um, two yeah. All right, uh, let's move through this relatively quickly then. Yeah. Um, so this first slide shows construction management consultant budget. Hasn't changed since last month. Uh, you can see here original award contingency and the amount of additional amendments that we've moved into sending out the fund. Uh, design consultant, so same as last month again, the original award with the contingency. That first amendment in February 2021 uh, that increased the overall project budget. And then the later amendment in September of this year that was taken for the And this is the construction contract. So you can see there's still a significant amount of contingency remaining there, um, even after improved change orders. Next slide. And then the requested uh, consultant amendments that came from that contract contingency, you can see that eating up the remaining contingency. So we're left with um, $284,566 remaining. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so when we were going through funding, um, I thought it best to bring in all additional costs that happened under this project. So on here, we have some on-call costs. Uh, this slide shows expenditure and budgets for our on-call specialty inspection conducted by Smith Emery and our labor compliance management undertaken by the Solis Group. So while relatively minimal costs in comparison to those three larger contracts on um, the previous slide, they are being reimbursed through our funding agreements. So I thought it important to include it there as we go through funding in a moment. As you can see, we have a small amount of budget remaining on the specialty inspection. Uh, however, we finish construction of the project. There may be a potential need to call them out when we do demolition after the 30 day uh, testing, but it's relatively minimal. So we don't expect to exceed the budget there. And the same goes for the labor compliance budget on the bottom there. Uh, the Solis Group have done an excellent job of managing our PLA, as I went through earlier. At uh, this point there, their billing's pretty low each month, so we do not anticipate uh, using up our remaining budget. Next slide, please. I've also included this cost. This was a direct cost that we paid to Westec, the CMF uh, vendor, prior to construction for preparation of bid documents, special engineering services. Uh, it was $176,260 that we paid to Westec. Um, after that point, the contract was then assigned to the general contractor, so all remaining payments went through the general contractor. Uh, but this is a direct payment we made to them before construction. And again, this was fully reimbursed in funding, so I don't get on to it in a moment. Uh, next slide, please. So here's the total. Um, I've updated the overall project budget there to include those, the Westec costs and the two on call. Um, budgets. Uh, the contingency still remains the same though. We had $284,566 remaining in that contingency in the project budget. Uh, and then we still have some on call budget that will be uh, used up slightly, but won't be fully spent. So, as I stated last month, we do not believe the remaining contingency on this project is enough to see us through with the extended date through to February 26th. Next slide, please. One of the reasons uh, we don't expect it to see us all the way through with these potential change orders. Uh, the good news is that since my last presentation, we've negotiated reductions in the total PCO exposure. So we've negotiated these PCOs and agreed on final values uh, as the pending tend to be accepted. As we've uh, negotiated some, you'll notice the change from last month from the disputed total into the pending total. Uh, we've negotiated the PCOs uh, with the contractor, reduced the amounts and now that tends to be accepted and ready to go into a future change order. Um, we're currently in negotiations still with a number of PCOs. So as it currently stands, all of the ones currently under negotiation, if they were all to be uh, turned into change orders, it would total a $101,000 credit. Um, so there's a couple of large uh, credit PCOs in there that we're expecting to kind of negotiate with the contractor over the next month or so. Uh, and then finally, there's $110,000 there in future estimated change orders. So uh, these are this is work that has been undertaken in the last few months, but we don't yet have a final cost from the contractor. Uh, the TNM model. 
That brings us to a total of $490,673 in total PCO exposure. Uh, that's a reduction of $143,854 in the with contract over the last one. Next slide, please. As I mentioned, this slide hasn't changed from last month, but it's worth going over again. Um, new schedule completion date is February 26, 26 2024. Um, we anticipate that this extension will require an additional $200,000 in consulting costs. This estimate does not include contingency. And as I mentioned at the top of the presentation, it's based on the assumption that the 30 day testing we're about to undertake will be fully successful. If this assumption is incorrect uh, and we need to restart testing and then pushes the end of the project out, we may need to extend the project beyond February. Um, and this will likely incur additional sum costs, but we'll obviously come back if that happens. Um, I just wanted to note on this, we are in the home stretch of this project now. The only remaining major task is that 30 day testing period. Uh, we anticipate, as I mentioned, we'll starting mid January. We have some minor punch list items to complete before then, such as moving control of the new system over to the plant control room, commissioning a few valves, installation of the remaining, remaining membranes, and the programming of those clean and play sequences. All of these are currently progressing as planned. If we start the 30 day testing in mid January and it's successful, we will meet that completion date of February 26th. If the 30 day testing requires a restart, or if one of those minor tasks that I just mentioned takes longer than planned, we may require a further project, project budget increase to cover the remaining time. Um, but it's unlikely to be more than an additional month. The only potential cost I can see beyond this, um, extending beyond the completion date, is for our construction manager. Um, as they chase the contractor for final documents, OM information, warranty information, and so on in the last month as a minimum cost. Um, I'm letting you know this now. I know that we've been back with this project quite a few times. Uh, we've seen significant delays in this project, some major issues and unexpected blockage, blockages over the last few years. So far, we've been able to manage these within the existing project budget in 2021. Um, this is the first time we're bringing about the project for an overall budget increase. While we wish it in the case, um, I wanted to lay it all out before you that there is potential for a small budget increase in the future if the 30 day testing doesn't go well. But hopefully it does. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, this slide is also one you've seen before. So it's the additional site improvements that we may wish to undertake uh, outside of the phase two project at a later date. We include these the overall, overall program project budget increase request, as these would still be considered part of the overall site improvements at JMM, phase two improvements, but they would be undertaken once our current contractors are off the site and the CMS system is fully operation. Next slide, please. So I've got funding after this, but for now, the summary of anticipated costs, as I mentioned, we still have that $284,566 for project continuity remaining, all of which is on the construction contract. However, our current PCO exposure would take us beyond that current project budget. And so with anticipated consultant amendments due to the new schedule and potential proposed site improvements, the project budget would need to increase by $606,107. So staff are today requesting the board consider increasing the project budget to $28,426,063 in preparation for these anticipated expenses. Um, as you'll see on the following slides, this cost increase is still within our secured funding agreements. Next slide, please. So last month, this committee requested that we return with details on how we intend to fund the project budget increase. Um, so this slide details all of our confirmed funding agreements for the project. We've secured $29,676,058 in funding for this project. $13,950,532 are in the form of directly reimbursed costs. So that's uh, $8,078,282 in a Proposition 1 grant. $4 million from a Cal Water Grant and $1,872,250 from the Marathon Refinery that directly reimbursed most of our design costs. So the remaining $15,725,526 is in the form of a 25 year loan from the state revolving fund with a 1% interest rate. We have a current committed expenditure of $27,535,390 on this project and the anticipated additional costs that I'm presenting today total 890,673, which includes that remaining contingency that brings it down to 606,000. So this brings our anticipated project expenditure to $28,426,063, which is $1.2 million below the total funding level. 
Uh, so this means that all project expenses, including those presented today, are covered under the available funding. Next slide, please. Uh, so this slide just details how much of the funding we've actually received and how much we anticipate requesting. So to date, we have received $5,488,018 direct reimbursements, and we anticipate using the full 13.95 million available to us. We have received one disbursement from the State Water Resources Control Board so far, and have just applied for the second disbursement. So our first disbursement of $7.3 million was split 50-50 between the Prop 1 grant and the low interest loan. And we expect the second disbursement of around $14.5 million to use up the remaining money in the, in the grant and for the rest of that disbursement and future disbursements from them to come from the loan. Uh, we've also received that $1.9 million from the American refinery or we received that for the early design costs. And um, we've yet to request disbursement of the 4 million cow water grant that has got to occur at the end of the project after project completion. Uh, one important consideration today is that we're not yet certain uh, whether the $200,000 of additional site improvements that we mentioned in the previous slide, that's the landscaping and site grading, whether that's eligible under our current funding agreements. There is room in the funding agreement uh, total, the funding total for that $200,000, but we're not yet sure uh, if, because it's happening outside of the project, if it's eligible um, under those agreements. So if included in the budget approval today, we'll begin discussions with the State Water Resources uh, Control Board as to whether uh, this $200,000 can be included in the remaining funding that's available to us. Um, and in terms of that low interest loan, I've already mentioned that half of the disbursement one was taken from this loan portion. So the loan disbursement so far is $3,615,768. So given our anticipated project expenditure, we anticipate requesting a total loan amount of $14,275,530. And this will equate to approximately an annual payment of $650,000 per year over the next 25 years. So to reiterate the answer to the question last month, all proposed project costs will be covered under existing funding arrangements. With the consultant amendments and PCOs discussed here today coming from the low interest loan portion of the funding. There are some questions as to whether those additional site improvements would be covered, and we'll be sure to confirm those before we obviously bring any awards back before you. Next slide, please. And with that, I'll read the staff recommendation. So staff recommends that the board authorize the general manager to increase the project budget by $606,107 for a new not to exceed project budget, $28,426,063. And with that, I'll take any questions. Hey, thank you very much, John. Director Williams, do you have any questions? Uh, yes, I I certainly would like to see us find that two hundred thousand dollars for the landscaping. I mean, that's that's a small amount of money. I mean, we should be able to find that somewhere. Uh, I would appreciate if you hunt for that. Other than that, I'm I'm cool. Director, do you have any comments? No. Director Gray, do you have any comments? Director Gray. No, yeah. thank you, um, Chair. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. Um, I have a couple of questions. Slash comments. So there's still, if I listen to your presentation correctly, there's still a potential that you're going to come back and ask for a small additional budget increase above and beyond the 600000 that we're asking for today. Potentially, yeah. And we've adjusted the budget for this particular project multiple times now. This will be the first time we've adjusted the overall project budget since 20 on the we adjusted the budget. This is the first time you've asked for money for additional money. Yes, we've moved money between we've contracts. We've moved yeah. money around several times um, in order to fund uh, different elements, including the landscaping element. Um, and so now that money that would have been in the contingency is all gone. And so we're asking to increase that, and we may be back asking for additional money in a future date. Uh, 
I um, I understand that, uh, and the answer to your question, Director Williams, is in the report. If they cannot get it from the state grant, uh, they will get it uh, just basically from uh, uh, district parks. Yes. Um, so we're still looking at a potentially unknown amount of money that we have to uh, adjust the budget or increase the budget for this project on. I haven't heard any real argument, uh, convincing argument that says why we need to do this now and not just wait till the end of the project when we understand what all of our costs are and adjust the budget at that time, which would be um, the way that I, I feel more comfortable with in just one time adjustment instead of this dribbling multiple uh, budget adjustments and then uh, requests for additional budget authority. Um, so I'm not comfortable with that. And then I do have another comment. I guess this would be more to the general manager. In the staff report, uh, it does talk about this presentation uh, being made at two previous meetings. Um, the uh, February 26th and the March 16th. But we did discuss this at the November 21 meeting, and although it was uh, discussed uh, very well here uh, by John in his presentation, uh, there was no discussion uh, in the staff report that this has been uh, considered and some of the items that were pointed out by John that were brought up by the board uh, or by this committee uh, at the November uh, meeting uh, should have been and should have been included in the staff report. I feel more comfortable with the written reports being more comprehensive. So just. Dr. Alvarez, it is noted in the committee history as, as a brief FYI, but I understand what you're saying that it could be uh, well, you, you, you know, you noted for, earlier in the, uh, the agenda item. Uh, I, I would, would like good to have a lot of that discussion that John presented identified. You know, you could have had all those bullets in the staff report. Uh, if, if it's okay with the chair, I would like to address your first point, which was that this would have um, limited impacts that we could bring it back at a later date. Uh, we are anticipating invoices, and we will, because of the, the restrictions or the, the total project budget, we would have difficulty paying upcoming expected or anticipated invoices. That is correct. And so we would actually have uh, at least one of our consultants, I believe it's Boudier, uh, would be impacted on this. And we would have to very much limit uh, the work that they would be doing on this project because we do not have adequate budget to pay those invoices. So this would have a significant impact on our ability to pay these invoices and could potentially further delay the project. I mean, the contractor is going to stop working. Well, we would have to notify them that we would not be able to pay them on their invoices. And I don't know uh, if uh, Barca Masurlian, or Executive Manager of Engineering and Operations, has anything to add to that point. But yeah, whether the contractor um, decides to stop working if we're not paying the invoices, that's a decision that the contractor would have to make. I can't speak how they would react to it, but it, it's a um, it's certainly a possibility. Um, I don't think, given all the circumstances that we have discussed in the past, uh, both in open and closed session, I think uh, that, that would occur. Um, with regards to the consulting company, the uh, Butcher Search Management Services in particular, uh, yeah, they would be out of budgets really soon here. So they're, if, if we don't increase the budget and award them an extension, then um, they basically can't manage the remainder of the construction um, out there in the field. And we're pretty much with all the construction, if I, and maybe I misunderstood, pretty much done. Yeah. So Structure. most of the items are startup items and close out items. Yeah. Mission and demolition. So maybe some of their services could be cut back a little bit. 
it, it seems like that we're at pretty much at the end of the job. Yeah. Uh, although they would need to be, at least their project manager would be need to be available for the closeout portion. So their current burn rate is throughout the project has been about eighty to ninety thousand dollars a month. Uh, right. Eighty to ninety thousand. Eighty to ninety thousand. Yeah. The um their current burn rate is about forty thousand, forty to forty five. So they cut back significantly. They did have two inspectors on site and the CM um, full time. The CM is now down to four days a week. Um, and their remaining electrical inspector is on site only two days a week um, for the final commissioning, punch list items. Uh, there's a connection with DCS connection to move over to the control system, so they're managing that at the moment. Um, but we have asked them to cut back as, as much as possible. Yeah. So Maybe the, I'm misunderstanding, but I thought we still had like $284,000 available. We do, yes. Um, so that would cover the they said boot here invoices. Yeah, we're yes, we'd need to come back to you with a contract amendment again. Um, the last contract, uh, they're, they're out of uh, the funds on that previous contract amendment. So we need to come back with another consultant amendment. That would be around $150,000 to see it through to the end of the project. Um, and so that would be covered under contingency, but then we would not be able to award any of the change orders, change orders that are on the table. Um, we would be very restricted in potentially any awards for a design consultant to, for them to see it out to the end of the project. Um, we would use up that remaining money very quickly. If I understand it correctly, it's the middle of December. The project is going to wrap up in February. At that time, we will have a tidy idea of what the whole budget is. You need to bring back the uh, CM contract for a contract amendment in order for them to get paid for their additional work. And so even if, help me on this, so you were earlier saying that you couldn't pay their invoices now, would we paying their invoices without having a contract amendment to cover their overage? Not received that December this year. So then? They were, they had funding up until the first week of December. Right. We need to come back with a consultant amendment. But what this would do if we come back with a consultant amendment that takes 150,000 out of that 284, I also have a change order on the table at the minute um, for about $200,000. That change order is with? With Felug. Felug, right. Yeah. Yes. So the so, 20,000 would become $350,000. I understand. The Felug portion, we have other issues with them. I think that's going to get resolved at the end of the job. Um, so you're talking about right now the CM portion. Um, they're not billing at a burn rate of 90, 000, 80 to 90,000 a month. It's closer to 15 to 20. Um, and you do have some funds left. So again, it would be, I would feel much more comfortable looking at this in its totality, making a higher budget adjustment at that time, but having, bringing back whatever uh, consultant and, uh, contract amendments need to be made with the uh, contract, which would be the, whatever the final adjustment sh uh, change order is, uh, and deal with it at one time. That's my preference. So I'm not ready to move this forward in the board. I think that this item uh, still needs to be worked and it needs to be just wrapped up in one package. I can just clarify. I'm looking at Marianne. If we receive an invoice from Boudier in this next month, will we be able to pay it? Don't have enough funds in the contract, we won't release the invoice. There's fourteen thousand dollars left on the contract. Okay. Um, I'm expecting an invoice of around fifty to sixty thousand. So. so we cannot pay it. We cannot release it. So do you or do you not have two hundred and? So we would need to come back. $84,566. So, so if I'm understanding the chairman correctly, the chairman is uh, perhaps suggesting that the remaining contingency be utilized for Gutierrez. Whatever you guys want to do. And, and whatever else <laughs> we prioritize when it comes to the contractor. Uh, Whatever change orders or percentage change orders we agree to, all that gets settled 
the end of the project. The risk with all of that is that it could further make things more complicated at the construction site uh, due to delays. Uh, that's the risk that we would be taking on if we don't if we go that route, as, as you're aware. So we have something we obviously have discussed in closed session. That's not going to go away. That will be settled one way or another. Okay, so setting that aside, I'm not quite sure that there's going to be any more tension than you already have. Um, and you have a contingency. You guys can move that contingency around. Um, and it's sufficient that's available in the contingency to cover Gutierrez contract. Gutierrez needs to come back for another amendment. This would be, I think, their second, if not their third amendment, right? Um, and I think you're also going to bring back an amendment for the uh, engineering contract. Or is that one done? No, we need to come back for a minute. So again, we have a lot of loose ends. It would be nice to bring this back. And, and really, the better way to handle these things is bring them all back and wind comprehensive and address all of these issues instead of us having to sit here and say, well, wait a second, didn't we just adjust their budget? Why are we amending another contract now, et cetera? Um, and he, there is no urgency. I, I just don't see the urgency. So I'm not ready to move this forward. I would like to be that probably in February when it's ready to be wrapped up. And you can bring back all of the agreements that need to be amended and the final budget and where all that money can come. Sorry, just to clarify, you'd like us to bring back in February agreements that need to be amended. So not bring back a Boutier amendment next month. No, because I don't think you're ready. I mean, you just, unless you know for sure that that's it, that you know what the final thing is. You know, right, last month you said we we're going to start taking water in December. Now you're saying we're going to start taking water in January. Uh, are we really going to start taking water in January, or is it going to be that we'll look at this next month and we're going to be taking water in February? The current schedule shows January. Yeah, the current schedule, the last month you told me that the current schedule showed and taking it in December. So it, it, it just seems like it, we have this continual moving target. Chairman, we'll be happy. Yes. Mr. Chairman, I'll, I'll reconvene staff. We'll bring this back. If there's any reason to bring it back uh, prior to February, uh, I'll notify you okay. and we can discuss that, but we'll we'll table this discussion for today. Thank you. That's a call to committee. Okay. So we will move on. The next items up is the information calendar. So we have the cost of service study. General manager. Yes, Mr. Chairman, uh, this item is a uh, item that has lingered within the, uh, just for the past uh, month as well. We did bring this uh, presentation originally to the Finance and Administrative Committee uh, and a uh, member of the committee, Mr. Uh, uh, Director Harold Williams uh, requested that this be added to a future uh, ENO uh, agenda. Uh, as such, we did agendize this uh, for this past month in November, though uh, time did not permit for the uh, presentation. And so we have that presentation for you today. Uh, and so we have our uh, manager of finance here, uh, Marianne Rexford, for the presentation. Thank you, EJ. Good afternoon, Chairman Alvarez, members of the committee and board. Um, I could go through introducing the item, and we have Eric Helgeson, who is with the Bartle and Wells team, who is here to present vir virtually, um, or we can just take questions however you would like to handle Why don't you do the presentation? Okay. All right. Thank you very much. So as EJ had indicated, we brought this item back on several occasions to the FNA committee back in September, October, and then this latest one in November, um, as EJ indicated, this particular presentation uh, was presented and Director Williams has asked us to bring it here to the <laughs> committee. Um, I believe Eric, are you online with us? He would walk us through the presentation. You might have to do it. <laughs> I will do my best. All right, would you uh, mind Desiree bring it? <laughs> so if we go to the next slide. In the agenda we were talking about at the last the event for e, uh, f and committee, we talked about financial planning and cost allocations, and that's something we wanted to share with the 
the directors to show how integrated our system is and how we need to break that apart for our cost um, allocations. And we also were asked to bring back a survey on similar types of agencies uh, that we compare to and, and what that looks like. So we have those two items for you today. So let's move on to the next. All right, and next slide, please. So one of the things that we want to keep in mind when we're presenting on a cost of service area, we want to make sure that we have full cost recovery. That's really important because it's not only your O&M costs, it's your capital costs, and also making sure that your reserves are fully funded. In addition, you want to make sure that your revenues are predictable and stable. You don't want to have spikes or drops. So that's something we want to look into the future. So we won't look at just current fiscal year. We'll be looking out into the future. As I mentioned, you want rate stability. Transparency is also very important. We want to make sure our rate payers understand what we're asking for and why we're asking for the rates that we will need in the future to do the projects and to continue to produce recycled water. We also have equity and cost allocation. It's very important for us to be able to prove to our customers that the, the charges that we have for them are equitable and that they're fair across all types of water. And of course, we want to think about simplicity because we as staff are going to have to implement these changes in the rate structure going forward. And so we want to make sure that it's simple that not only we can understand it, but our customers can understand it as well. And of course, legal and defendable. Um, that's top priority. We want to make sure that we can't be challenged on any of our rates going forward. So next slide, please. All right. Um, this is just an overview of all the different types of water, if you will. Um, of course, we have our potable system, and then we have our recycled system broken down between all the different various types between the barrier, the Title 22, Chevron Nitrified, and I won't read them all, but those are all the different types of water and the costs that we're going to look at. We're going to break up those costs into those different types of processes. Next slide, please. I don't know that I can do this diagram justice, but this gives you an idea of how complicated our system is over at, the, at um, within our recycling treatment facilities. Um, you can see there's a lot of integration. We have water coming from Hyperion. Those costs of Hyperion are then shared between all the types of water we produce. We have the, the Title 22 system, which those costs are then shared between only some of the water we produce and so forth and so on. So I think the next slide maybe give you a little bit more deeper understanding of how that works. So this is how we would like to look at our costs is based on how the water and those dollars flow. So on the right, you have all the different types of processes that we have, and you can see on the left, all the costs that we would share among all those types of processes. The Title 22 is an exception because not all of our types of water use Title 22. So the barriers outside of that, as well as Chevron boiler feed. Next slide. So any questions on that before we go over to the liquidity survey? Any questions for Mr. Williams? No. Mr. Deere? No. Director Gray, do you have any questions so far? No, thank you. Um, <clears throat> since you asked. Yeah. And I see Eric has just joined us as well. Great. Um, I've seen the, the presentation. To me, the most important part and really the whole cost allocation is what is the cost to produce the water? And um, as you just uh, referred to in the uh, previous slide, uh, you can go back to slide and the one before that. We do have a lot of uh, specific treatment processes um, that we, because of the way our, the nature of our system, uh, that we operate to deliver different types of water to different users. And we've never really tracked what the cost of these are and hence where we are today. To me, the most important thing is to have a real detailed analysis of what these individual costs are. And even looking at um, the list of costs, that's some stuff that I'm not quite sure. I haven't seen the details of the study, and it's not in the presentation or in the staff report that we're given today. But I hope that this is a, uh, uh, the direction that you are proceeding in and that you will bring back that information. Uh, some of these um, processes uh, apply to more than one 
um, providers. So, for example, Title 22 water is the feed water, then it goes to the Marathon and Carson facility. Um, so the cost of that water, and then there's additional costs for those. So at the end of the day, are we going to make sure they are, we should make sure that we have the individual cost component and those cost components are going to vary even within uh, a particular customer. They may be, and they, and some of them are, uh, receiving two types of water. So they will at least have two different um, costs that they will be billed at in the future so that we are truly recovering the cost. That's correct. So what we'll do is we'll take all the common costs like Hyperion and each type of water will receive a percentage of that. Then you're going to have your Title 22 costs and those, again, customers that share in that Title 22 cost will be allocated a dollar amount for each of whatever acre feet they use. And then it layers with that. And so you're going to have a total based on these different pieces that were allocated. They may be different allocation depending on what the item is. Sludge might be allocated different than power or so forth. And those are all the things that are contemplated in this study. So it's going to be very detailed. Um, we can show you, you know, all the backup and we can keep it at a very high level. But that information is definitely included. And just one other thing I wanted to say, staff has done a similar type of allocation every year for at least 10 years that I can think of the top of my head. Um, now, this is the first time that we're having external consultants review that and then hopefully either cooperate, correct, improve upon those allocations. And then the idea is that we want to be able to put this in a, a methodology and a financial tool so that every year that we're following it and be much more straightforward and simple for us to internally be able to manage. Well, that is I'm looking forward to being able to adopt a rate structure that recovers from for each uh, water type the actual cost of that water, so that everybody just pays their fair share and no cross subsidy. In terms of, we have a significant amount of bonded indebtedness or debt, um, and how is that going to be a portion? Or is that being reviewed to be not? You don't need to tell me how right now. I want to make sure that we are actually able to recover the debt that we have, because that debt is part of the investment that was made in the recycle one. So we have considered it, and we do have mm -hmm. a method of allocating, which we'll we can present at a little later date. All right, so that is all being moved forward, and we will see presentations of that in the future. Thank you. There is one more slide. If you'd like to go over that, that's on the liquidity, the, the comparison between West Basin and other agencies. So if we can go forward to that slide, thank you very much. So this gives you um, a viewpoint of just one year. Um, I have information if we wanted to go back and talk about some of the early years and what our statistics look like. But you can see um, West Basin at the very top. Um, as far as our cash on hand, we have about 73 days work. Compared to um, our counterparts, you can see we are very low. Um, I think a number of times we've talked about what our financial um, uh, financial advisors have told us that we do need to increase this. Cash is king. It gives you flexibility. It prevents you at times to go out in the market to get loans if it's not a good time. So it's nice to have enough in your back pocket so when you need it, you don't have to go out and take it when it's expensive. So it's important for us to think about having enough reserves. Also, your debt service coverage um, is quite low compared to our, again, our con counterparts. Um, we have seen that drop. Um, looking back into, I went back a few years, um, our high was in 2018. We were at a 2.3. Um, starting in 2020, we dropped to 2.89. 21, 1.84. 22, 1.47. And we just finished this fiscal year at a 1.36. I just want to caution when the credit rating agencies look at this, the next time we go out for debt, that is a red flag. So we want to make sure that we start moving that dial up as well as our cash. 
Um, but you can see also in the right hand corner, the S&P bond rating, we are at a double A minus right now. Again, that is on the low side of all of our counterparts. So with that, I'll just stop and see if any questions and then Eric's here if he has any more to add to it. Williams, do you have any other questions or comments? Not now. Hey, Director Deal. So confused. Director Gray. No, thank you. I uh, <coughs> don't have uh, it much other than it'd be nice to see when you do this uh, liquidity survey. Uh, I, I noticed that a lot of those agencies are also retail agencies or a wholesale agency. There is a difference, and there's a difference in terms of what's pragmatical in terms of the amount of cash you need to have on hand. So in the future, can we just compare apples to apples and bring back just retail agencies and not, I'm sorry, uh, wholesale agencies to compare us with and not mix and match? People try to do so. It is hard to find comparisons. West Bay is quite unique. Yeah, all right. But it, may, it, it does make a difference when you're looking at these things and you understand that there are different guidelines for different types of agents. Absolutely. Okay. All right. Well, thank you very much. We will then move on. The next item up is the uh, Solids Handling Improvements Project Progress Update. Yes. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, item 6B, as you mentioned, is the Solids Handling Improvement Project Progress Update. Uh, this, again, is an item that was brought forward uh, uh, just this past month, but due to time limitations, we, we just bring it back uh, here in December. Uh, and this is being brought to you at the request of the chairman uh, earlier this year, requesting uh, regular updates. Mm -hmm. So for this presentation, we have uh, John Venner again, our engineering team. Okay. All right, this, so this update on the Handling Project begins on packet page 89 with the presentation beginning on page 95. Uh, so we'll begin with the usual background slides. I'm sure you've seen this slide enough by now, um, but this project aims to rehabilitate solids handling filter presses over the next two years, a project cost of $15.3 million, and with an estimated return investment of 4.7 years from the outset of design. We're currently in the design phase. Uh, we had the kickoff in August 30th this year, and we're uh, re-evaluating that return investment. We've got the PDR on, on Friday. The draft of the PDR, and so we'll be reevaluating that return investment on uh, presenting the results of the PDR and that reevaluation next month. Next slide, please. This is another slide we've seen before. Uh, this next week shows what rehabilitation will entail. We intend to replace the two oldest sludge conditioning tanks outside the Solis Handling Building. Uh, they were originally installed in 1993 and are well beyond their useful life. And then we're replacing those four feed pumps that were also installed in 1993 and associated feed piping due to the poor condition. Um, replacing the pumps is one of the biggest elements of this design. We then intend to replace or rehabilitate a number of components of the presses themselves. So some elements such as the hydraulic cylinders will be replaced. Uh, other elements such as the filter plates themselves will be sent off to be shot blasted, uh, repaired and recoated. And then we have some auxiliary systems such as the acid wash and cloth washing subsystems that will be mostly replaced, but there's some key components there that we're just going to repair and retain. So perhaps the biggest element of the rehabilitation will be the replacement of the original instrumentation control system. These systems have changed a lot since 993, and the current system can only be operated manually. We intend to replace this with a more modern control system that will provide the operators with the ability to control the system remotely freeing up operators for other work and allowing for more advanced asset, ma asset management and maintenance plan. Next slide, please. Uh, so this is the intended design schedule. As you remember, we're holding the uh, consultant to a tight eight month schedule uh, as we're currently overspending on O&M every month. So we wanna get the system operating in its refurbished condition as soon as possible. The kickoff meeting for this project was held at ECL on August 30th and condition assessment efforts were undertaken throughout September. These efforts focus on verifying the results of the last, last condition assessment that was conducted in 2018, and it's the basis on which the project was developed. So the key focus there was on assessing if there are any major changes since 2018. So the condition assessment report was submitted to staff on October 6th. Um, we provided a brief update to the committee as part of the engineering update for that month, um, and then we intend to bring full update last month for the time reasons it was pushed to this month. 
The next step in this project is to produce the preliminary design report. This report includes 30% design of all components to be replaced or refurbished, recommendations on which components the district should procure, and an estimate of the total construction costs that will be used to reevaluate that 4.7 year return investment calculation. As I said, we received the first draft of that PDR on Friday, and we'll, we'll be presenting the full results in January. Next slide, please. So onto the actual results from the condition assessment. As I mentioned, this assessment's main aim is to evaluate if condition assistance change substantially since 2018, and if any of those changes would affect this plan. So six components have worsened since 2018. We anticipated this result with four of those. Uh, the two unexpected items of concern were the sludge grinders and some columns inside the building. So these sludge grinders were only installed in 2015 and are in a worse condition than we did expect. They're exhibiting signs of corrosion and wear that we would not anticipate systems that new. And then the building columns, they're showing advanced corrosion around some of the base plates. So the OEDR are currently undertaking condition assessments uh, for both of those. They're going to take apart the sludge grinders and inspect the internals, and they're going to have material specialists down to look at the corrosion around the base plates. But I'm happy to report that the 10 other components had no major change since 2018. And so despite those two unexpected items of concern, and we had six newly assessed components that were assessed in 2018 as well, we don't believe that there are any major changes that would impact the project plan or return on investment calculations from the condition assessment. So with this condition assessment verification, this was the aim it was to mitigate one of the most significant risks. Next slide, please. Uh, here we have some pictures from the condition assessment report. That's the slug, one of the four sludge grinders on the left. Um, signs of corrosion despite being relatively recently installed. So the OER take that apart to have a look inside to make sure the internal working is working well. The conveyance speed piping here that's on the underside of the second floor. Um, most of this was actually in uh, better condition than we anticipated. There's some areas that will need to be mostly around the junctions of the pipes that will need to be replaced, but most of it can just be pink and be painted. Um, and then on the right there, there's uh, one of the building columns with corrosion. It's quite difficult to see in this, but we'll be getting the idea of sending out metal uh, metallurgist experts to look at the materials there to see if the corrosion is well, too deep to the columns. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, we have some more pictures here. So this is one of the existing feed pumps on the left there. We're planning to take out all four feed pumps and replace them. These able feed pumps uh, were original from the time uh, they originally built. And they've had a number of maintenance issues in the last few years. They're continually being prepared, maintained, taken offline. Um, it's, it's pretty rare that we have all the pumps running. Uh, in the middle there, you can see the acid wash pump motor. So this is a pump from the acid wash tank that pumps acid into the presses to dissolve a lot of the uh, solids that remain on the plates. Uh, that motor is uh, significantly corroded. We're we'll replacing that on this project. And then Image six, you can just about see there, there's corrosion around the base of two sludge conditioning tanks. Um, we replaced the two outside tanks in 2015 or 16, I believe, but the two inner tanks uh, are original from the origins of the farm. So we'll be replacing those two internal, two inner tanks. Next slide, please. Uh, so in terms of the impact of this condition assessment report, as I stated, it doesn't currently change our original plan. Um, the only can conduct those project inspections on those two items, and if there's any major change there, we'll bring it back. Um, but otherwise, we're looking at a pretty even split here amongst the components. So we're intending to retain just over a third of the components and replace another third, and then the remaining third is made up of components we'll rehabilitate and the components that the other are going to conduct further inspection on. So obviously, even for those components we retain, we're going to be cleaning them, repainting them um, where applicable to ensure the facility looks as good as new by the end. Next slide, please. <clears throat> so this slide depicts the overall project schedule. As always, any changes from the last update, the last update before, uh, before November are in red text. Uh, diamonds here represent board action, report presentations, while boxes represent staff actions. So in the top left, you see the project review that we presented in the ONO uh, in October 2022. Um, and then we presented uh, Several items concerning a quick win replacement of those cloths um, earlier this year, uh, which was completed in May. So the design phase here is in the red box. Uh, we'll develop that pre procurement list from the PDR that we've received and then to bring the PDR back to you in January and pre procurement list uh, within a couple of months of that. And the aim is to begin 
construction award sometime uh, in the summer this year uh, with a one year construction period. And obviously that's a very tight schedule, but the aim is to reduce O&M so costs as soon as possible. So, and that concludes the status update on soil conditioning project. Thank you, Dan. Good day for learning. Uh, no, thank you. Thank you, Dan. Oh, thank you. Good day for Gray. No, thank you. <clears throat> um, in, you just said that the PDR was just completed. The uh, draft PDR was received <clears throat> In the draft PDR, did they look at any alternatives? No, they did not. Um, the alternatives were looked at in 2018. We did a pilot study of centrifuge systems. Um, we looked at a variety of different systems. Uh, the centrifuge system was originally selected. However, because uh, solid schooling, the cost of that is skyrocketed, that made the switch to sludge handling, uh, to, sorry, the filter presses, rehabbing the filter presses, uh, lower cost. It would have been nice to. If I may, also, we, we did look at alternatives following the 2018 uh, and conducted additional studies to look at more additional alternatives, uh, potentially going to the sewer and, and other types of alternatives. And uh, so I think I can't remember exactly the number, but it was maybe seven, eight, or nine different alternatives that we looked at before proceeding with this. Effort. So it would be nice to update previous studies as part of this and not assume never know that it's another thing that may have changed. Um, so if that is possible, I think that the PDR might, since we just got a draft, but one of the comments might be to review alternatives and previously consider at least update the numbers. All the numbers have changed, including the numbers for this and continue to change. So maybe discuss that in the PDR and have a better understanding. Um, and I still have any concerns with the whole issue of even if the treatment processes that we have in place today are adequate for the waste load that we're handling versus the waste load that this was designed to uh, accommodate. And that, uh, maybe, maybe we need to step back and really look at that entire system. Uh, maybe there should be nothing else in the PDR that looks at the uh, appropriateness of the process using the waste that we're dealing with. That would be additional so, story. Just a comment, but if you'd like to see that, and since you're in a draft, we can maybe go back and discuss it with the consultant. We'll, we'll go back and take a look at that. Uh, and and see what the cost would be to go to back to those alternatives. What would the cost impact and the and schedule impact be to go back and revisit past alternatives that we looked at? Before we rush to uh, issue any um, packages for uh, advanced equipment uh, acquisition. Because um, overall, if you look at the condition assessment, there isn't much change. Uh, there are a few items that are poor, uh, but pretty much everything is holding the same. Uh, I'm interested in kind of the maintenance aspect of things too. If you look at the uh, slide, page uh, 100, um, you know, if you look at that first image, the sludge trainer pump. A lot of that is in the exterior. I wonder if uh, over time, if that maintenance should have been done a little bit better and it would be painted like the one in image two, which you told me was in pretty good shape and it looks pretty good. Um, why aren't some of this equipment painted more frequently and things like that? Uh, maybe you can come back. I don't expect an answer to that right now, but as part of the whole maintenance protocol that should be in place, um, as opposed to letting the equipment and it just sit there, not being properly maintained, then it's, and then the corrosion gets worse and worse over time. And then all of a sudden, instead of having uh, regular maintenance, prolonging the life of it, all of a sudden you end up with 
having to replace this in a very expensive uh, cost to the district. So maintenance issues uh, might be something that we ought to look at. Same thing, uh, so we're looking at a column. I don't see that column in imminent danger of failure. Uh, but again, you know, over time, as these columns were uh, coated or painted uh, with uh, rust resistant paints, et cetera, uh, they've been there for 40 years, or not 40, 30 years, it's 95, um, that um, we might be able to have them uh, in slightly better condition than they are, not that they're in that bad of a condition. Um, so my concerns or my comments are some of the things that I see here um, that address, uh, go to the overall maintenance of the plant, I think that we have not necessarily done ourselves any service. Um, and so we're looking now at having to make an investment in things that otherwise should not be the case. And uh, that does not speak well for our maintenance practices. Um, maybe we can evaluate that, but I am more interested in the, having the PDR address some of the issues I should go to earlier. Maybe we can revisit this. Thank you for the presentation. Is there any other question? No, I just want to make a comment that uh, although I was straining to hear what you were saying, oh. but uh, but I I did hear the important parts and I and I and I agree with you. Just want to say that. Okay, moving on. The next item is the Chevron nitrification treatment plant bulk chemical storage. Don't even have the Yes, Mr. Chairman, uh, item 6C presented by Camille Castillo, uh, engineer two. BJ, good evening, members of the committee. If you follow me along to packet page 158, I will begin my presentation on a CNCP bulk chemical storage improvement sodium hypochlorite tank replacement project. So this project is part of an overall programmatic full chemical storage project that we have, and that's going to be looking at all of the chemical storage, containment, and piping in all of our facilities. And so this is a specific project to that, and it's located at the Chevron Nitrification Treatment Plant in El Segundo. Um, at this facility, we have <coughs> storage tanks on site. So two are 8,000 gallon sodium hypochlorite tanks shown in the yellow in the image on the left. Two are 2,500 gallon sodium bisulfate tanks shown in the purple. And then there's one 3,000 gallon sodium hydroxide tank located in the center. And so in 2017, one of the originally installed sodium hypochlorite tanks failed. Um, and so it was replaced with a 10,500 gallon HDPE tank. And in October of 2022, so last year, that temporary tank failed as well. And so it was replaced with two temporary 6,900 gallon red for red tanks. And that information was presented to the board in November 2022, and it began the, the initiation of this project. So if you go to the next packet page, nine, you'll see that for this specific project, we are looking at the removal of two temporary 6,900 gallon tanks, installing a new 8,000 gallon tank, and also performing a condition assessment of the existing sodium hypochlorite tank there, which is 7,632 gallons. So in May, we utilized our on-call solicitation process and onboarded Tetra Tech engineers to perform the design engineering services. In the summer, they performed their site visits and a survey, and they also hired um, Harper and Associates Engineering to perform a condition assessment of the existing 7,632 gallon tank. From that, they delivered a draft tech memo in August and also the results of the condition assessment. Essentially, that condition assessment said that the existing tank has exceeded its lifespan and is very poor condition. So with that said, we determined to authorize a new task order with Tetra Tech to also include the second um, sodium hypochlorite tank as part of this project. So on the next page, 160, you will see the scope of work for the tech memo that they prepared. It essentially, uh, we had them go and perform a site survey, perform a condition assessment, but ultimately look at the options that we have for the new tank and what kind of material it should be replaced with. We also wanted them to identify any safety improvements that includes anchoring and making sure it met chemical containment. And then as well as providing the cost estimates and construction schedule for what they proposed. And then we also wanted them to assess if it is qualifies for Buy American. And we did, in fact, clarify that it does, all of the parts should be manufactured in the United States. 
On the next page will be the results of the condition assessment. And so the existing 7,632 gallon tank is on the left. And you'll see that on the exterior, it's the poor, there is a poor paint condition. There's a lot of signs of corrosion. Um, essentially, the fiberglass is becoming exposed. The uh, anchoring and all the hardware is severely corroded. And then you'll also see even at the cracks, there's or there's cracks forming at the roof to shell transition. And inside as well, there's just further deterioration of the resin. Um, and so ultimately, it since it is from the design of the facility, it is exceeded its lifespan. On the next page, you will see the recommendations from this technical memorandum. Um, the proposed tank would be for both of the sodium hypochlorite tanks, and so they would be 8,090 gallons. Um, right now, we currently use 2,420 gallons of sodium hypochlorite at CNTP. And so from the current temporary tanks, we have a storage time of 5.7 days, but with these two new tanks, <laughs> storage time to 6.7 days. And the recommended material is fiberglass reinforced plastic, which has an estimated lifespan of 25 to 30 years. And so for this project, we wanted to ensure the lining um, was the best quality. So there is potential to have an RTP-1 stamp tank. Basically, that means that the tank will be manufactured at a certified uh, manufacturer and have a certified inspector making sure it's built per spec. If we want to have an RTP-1 specified tank, it would just be by the word of the manufacturer that it's being built per spec and not really have an inspector full time ensuring that quality. And so for those lead times, we have six to seven months for an RTP-1 specified tank, and we have eight to nine months um, lead time for an RTP-1 stamp tank. And the maintenance for an FRP tank is typically just visual inspection of the lining every two to three years. Um, there is potential for relining work um, potentially after 10 years. If there's an issue before that, then we'll have to address that then. The tank cost is 70,000 to 85,000 for an RTP-1 specified tank and 90,000 to 110,000 for an RTP-1 stamp tank. The proposed opportunities are a ladder, a new 24 inch roof manway and a 36 inch side manway and that's just for ease of access uh, for these new tanks we would also have new anchorage and a new foundation for the condition assessment in the site visits we found that the foundations are also deteriorating um, and for the construction of the project we wouldn't require a shutdown as we would utilize the three tanks there to make sure the facing is available and so on the next packet page 163 you'll see the estimated construction cost and reminding that this is for two tanks so the estimated construction cost includes the delivery and fabrication of the tanks, the new foundation, so it'd be 546,000. The contingency overhead and insurance would be 196,000 and our estimated construction management would be 82,000. And so that would leave a total estimated construction cost of 824,000. And I'll tack it page 164, you'll see the next steps. So the project adds completed its final technical memorandum and it were ready to go to design. So the next steps would be design drawings, is preparing the design drawing specifications and then coming back to the board for authorization of the tank pre-procurement because as you see the lead times were really long. So we want to make sure it, add, it matches up with the construction schedule as best as possible. And lastly, we would come to the board before construction as well. And with that, I am open to any questions you may have about the project. Thank you. Congratulations, any questions? Not at this time. Thank you. Director Deer. No. Director Gray. No, thank you, Chair. Thank you. Um, the works that's being done by Tetris Head, uh, that they've prepared the, the assessment and so on, that's part of their contract through design. Correct. So, they don't have a separate contract to do an assessment and then move to back and ask for a design contract. No, it's all under the same contract. How much is that contract? I believe it it's is. Oh, I believe it's um a hundred. I have to get back to you on what it is exactly because I I don't want to say the wrong thing. I just like to kind of keep track of all my soft costs. Okay. Um, and so this is now the next steps, uh, as you've said, are going you know, to be moving forward with the down drawings. Um, it should be pretty straightforward. So how much time do they anticipate taking 
to complete that? Um, about two months. I think it was what they estimated two months for the review and account is considering it's the holidays. We, we that's why it's a longer period. I remember at the time that this was brought to the attention of the board, this was a big emergency. That was over a year ago. So we call things emergencies that then can take over a year to address and, and by the time it's replaced they're almost two years. To me, an emergency is really something that needs to be addressed immediately. Okay, if there's no other questions or comments, we will move on to the next item, which is um, item D, the Juanita Melinda McDonald Carson Regional Water Recycling Plant Bulk Chemical so Storage Sodium Hypochlorite Tank Replacement Products. Yes, thank you very much, Mr. Chair. <laughs> Item 60 will be presented by Alejandro uh, Cano Alvarado, our engineer one. Thank you, EJ. Good afternoon, uh, Chairman Alvarez and members of the board. This information item is to provide an update on the sodium hypochlorite tank replacement project at the Juanita Millinder facility in Carson. Uh, the staff report starts in the agenda packet um, 165 and with the presentation can be found in packet page 167. If you go to the next slide, please. So as you might know, like West Basin relies on uh, chemical storage and feed systems throughout our uh, treatment facilities. So the bulk chemical storage tanks at the Juanita Millender in Carson, it's a critical component uh, to the pretreatment and nitrification process for the boiling feed and cooling towers applications. The facility contains about 11 chemical storage tanks that are uh, on site, and those are listed here in the uh, slide. And these tanks uh, were built in 1999 and are currently reaching their life of use. On August 10, 2022, the 8,000 gallon sodium hypochlorite tank experienced a critical failure. And the picture that uh, you see on the left bottom of the slide shows the leak um, of the tank. And due to this leak, um, we have to uh, immediately re replace this tank with a temporary 6,900 gallon of high density polyethylene uh, HDPE uh, rain for rain tank that was installed in this place and it's, um, it's been in operation since then. In October 2022, uh, staff provided an update of uh, the uh, critical failure at the board uh, in, a, in the, in the E&O committee. Um, the <laughs> replacement is part of the overall bulk chemical storage improvement project. Um, if you go to the next slide, please. So after the installation of the temporary tank, which is the picture that you see on the left side of the slide, uh, staff started working on the development of the RFP uh, to provide a permanent solution to this failure. Uh, during this time, the original tank now uh, was on live and remained in the facility on site. So on February uh, 2023, the tank was demolished uh, through the phase two expansion project. Um, and as we were going through the process of the request for, for solicitation, um, we used the on-call solicitation process. And in June 2023, we awarded AKM. Um, for the on-call design engineer services. Um, in July 2023, AKM performed a field investigation. Um, and in August 2023, um, the consultant provided a draft technical memorandum that uh, was submitted then. The recommendations were uh, then discussed with staff uh, during a workshop in late October. And um, now uh, we have to kind of make the decision to uh, proceed forward. I do want to note here that uh, there were some um, items and points that came after the technical uh, memorandum was submitted. So staff is currently reviewing those uh, points and verifying this information. And we'll go back to the board with a recommendation in January. This next slide, please. So the scope of work for the technical memorandum included um, Perform, the, performing um, performing uh, an inspection of the conditions of the sodium uh, hypochlorite tank and its uh, appurtenance, 
uh, compare uh, the time material options, whether uh, it could be a, a fiberglass reinforced a, a plastic or a, a high dense polyethylene or cross link polyethylene plastic tank. Um, they also assess the, the feasibility of increasing the storage uh, tank capacity, um, identify seismic conditions, and develop a temporary bypass plan for installation. And this is because we do not uh, currently have a redundancy in the system. And the technical memorandum also presents some cost estimates and presents some uh, construction schedule. In the next slide, please. So what you see here are the, the recommendations that the technical memorandum uh, included. Um, for the storage capacity, the, there is a, a slight increase of 8,500 gallons with dimensions of uh, 10 in, into diameter by 16. And this uh, storage capacity is for the for like storage time of 10 days. Um, this storage capacity has been increased based on the current chemical usage of 850 gallons per day. The recommendations that were provided in the technical memorandum is to uh, have a um, tank of um, cross-linked polyethylene plastic uh, as opposed to like, uh, FRP. These type of tanks are, uh, has an estimated last lifespan of about like 10 to 20 years. Um, and the lead time uh, to pre-prepare uh, the, the tank is about two to three months. These tanks are, don't require any maintenance and the cost of the tank itself is between 60,000 to 70,000. In, in terms of the appurtenance, uh, the recommendation is to include ladder next to the uh, 24 inches roof man, um, man weight. And in terms of the shutdown options, there were uh, two options that were evaluated during the technical memorandum. Uh, the recommended option is uh, have no shutdown and in, like include a temporary tank uh, in, as a bypass. Next slide, please. So for the construction estimated cost um, in this item, um, it's included the temporary tank bypass, the cost of that, the tank itself, any delivery tax, uh, seismic calculations and warranty, uh, and uh, the tank installation and the piping reconnection. So that uh, item is for the amount of $240,000. And the second item is the uh, the, what is described is the contingency overhead and insurance for the amount of uh, $132,000. And that includes like 20% uh, of the administration, 15% of CM and any inspections that will cause there, and 20% of contingency for the total estimated construction cost of $372,000. Next slide, please. So this slide includes like the next steps of um, what will be going uh, after we come back to the board with a recommendation next month. But essentially, um, we'll uh, have to prepare the design drawings and specifications, and of course, come to the board uh, for any authorization of the uh, um, design, or whether we can also whether we are like pre-procuring the tank or it, whether the tank is part of the project by the selected contractor. <laughs> and finally, uh, they, once we come back to the board, then the construction bid. So with that, I uh, will be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Very good. Any questions? No, thank you. No, Very questions. no, questions. no questions. Director Gray. Yeah. Um. So if we move forward with this, we're basically committing <clears throat> to another contract for a tank replacement. This is for one tank. Correct. Of about three hundred and fifty thousand dollars. Three hundred seventy-two. Yeah. Um. We put in a temporary tank, right? Sixty-nine hundred uh, gallon tank, and we're now going to replace it with an eighty-five hundred gallon tank. The sixty-nine hundred gallon tank was put in about a year ago when the other tank failed. 
and it's been in service since then. And what's wrong with the temporary cane? Well, a <laughs> well, the temporary tank is not bolted to uh, the uh, pad uh, mm -hmm. just placed there right now. So there is a risk of it being moved and, and uh, uh, causing some sort of interruption. And the fact that we don't have a second tank that is redundant to provide some reliability, a little bit concerning. And also we're paying rent for that tank um, to the tune of, I think, 3000 Yeah, about 3000 $3,000 a month. Uh, $3,000 a month. Okay, $3,000 a month to rent a tank? Yeah. Okay. Why didn't you just buy it? <laughs> yes. I, I uh, think this I, is a more permanent solution is what we're proposing. And uh, could, may I add something else? Uh, so in addition to that, there is uh, with the uh, new CMF, there is an increase in the demand for the chemical. So that's one of the reasons that the 6900 it requires more delivery frequencies and the difference is two days. You have with the 6900, you have eight days. With the 8500, you have 10 days. And that's without including the new system that is going to be online. In, yeah. Well, that's <laughs> you must a separate say. project. So. You don't want to go there. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Alvarez, I believe that also that question about like, oh, can we buy the tank from, you know, from this rental agency was asked in a while ago. And basically the rental agency said no because of liability issues. The tank has been used in the past by others and they don't want to pass on a liability, you know, to the sell selling the tank essentially. They don't want to pass on one, I'm sorry. The liability of that tank filling, you know, and selling it to us because it's been used before. So. Can we just wave them of that? I mean, the tank's been there for over a year. It's probably in good condition. If it had been bolted down, then the argument about the fact that uh, even though it hasn't moved at all in that in that period of time, but I agree that probably be bolted down um, would not be there, and we'd be done, and we wouldn't be visiting this here today. It just seems that sometimes there's a practical way to address some issues. That we might want to look into a little bit more. Yeah, they said no before. Yeah, if I, I didn't realize that we were renting a tank, um, and that's a lot of money to pay for a tank that you can buy the tank for basically not quite. But we paid for that tank today because we've been it got installed. Like if I recall correctly, this happened early last year, twenty two. Joel Ambrose, this. This is the option to buying a tank. It's just doing it properly, uh, getting it designed, getting it bolted in, uh, putting it in the right place. You, you put in that tank, you could have bolted it in, paid for it, and we'd be done, and it would be a lot less expensive than where we are today. Anyway, so temporary is smaller than what we of the existing right. tank. The, so the difference is two day storage based on the numbers that you guys use. Well yeah. 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 Director Gray, we're getting some background noise here. Maybe mute. Sorry. Because there's only one tank specifically, especially at that facility, we really need the extra volume. And with the new CMF going um putting in, we really um, we're actually utilizing even more uh, volume at that site. So we can certainly look into mm -hmm. if that is possible, but it's space. All right. Anyways, they're just my comments for your consideration. Um, it's 530. Um, so we need to wrap up the meeting. Is there any need to consider these items or this move them on? Uh, for receiving file. Mr. Chairman, I, I believe that uh, items E, F, and G in the written uh, memos and the presentations provide a great, a great deal of information that would be of use to the committee and the board. Uh, so if you wanted to uh, put those on 
uh, the full board in case uh, any member of the committee or board would like to pull those. We'll obviously be on hand on Wednesday to present those. Uh, otherwise, you can obviously review them on your own. That's okay. That's good. Make sure you receive and file annuals. Um, and so with that, we don't have a full session. Are there any directed comments? Comments? No. No, thank you. Just Mr. Dear. No. Director Gray. Okay. I don't have any additional comments, so we are adjourned.